So everyone, welcome to this uh, session at DCMI uh, Dublin Core Metadata Initiative 2022. Um, this session is, I think, is happening entirely virtually. I forget whether the entire conference is happening entirely virtually, but welcome. We're delighted to have the opportunity to talk to you today about the cross-domain interoperability framework, uh, subtitle coordinating standards for scalable practical fair data sharing. Um, I hope that will be of considerable interest to you. I think it connects with a lot of the longstanding um, interests of the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative and of those participants in that initiative and the, the community around it. I'm going to give a very quick um, outline of some of the background um, to our thinking about a cross-domain interoperability framework and to the speakers. Um, and you can see the, the speakers and the, the title of the presentations on the screen in front of you. A lot of this work and thinking has come out of a long-standing collaboration between my organization, Codata, and the DDI Alliance. And it goes back to really the middle of the last decade um, on the Codata side, at least. Codata is the Committee on Data of the International Science Council. And we were involved in some strategic discussions with our parent organization, the International Science Council, prior to a merger which created that entity. It came out of the merger of what was called ICSU, the International Council of Scientific Unions, and the International Social Sciences Council. And at that point in time, they were developing a new strategy and action plan. Now, Codata was created to exist to support always the mission and the strategy of, of that parent organization. And we felt that it was very timely to try and address some global issues around data and around reusability and the interoperability of data in, in, in particular. And that merger of ICSU and ISSC, the new International Science Council and the new strategy and action plan gave us an opportunity to really focus some of our attention. We felt in discussions with that parent body that the most pressing issue was to try and ride the wave of attention that had been created by the FAIR principles to explore issues of open science, which we had already been doing, but to try and focus attention on the requirements of what we've been calling cross-domain grand challenge research areas. So those areas of research, which are of essential for planetary and human survival, which are uh, core to the UN priorities at the moment and many of the scientific priorities of nations around the world. Things like climate change and climate change mitigation and adaptation. Things like all those research areas that relate to, that help us achieve, that respond to the, social, uh, the sustainable development goals, or things like uh, Sendai and disaster risk reduction. Now, the premise of, of what we developed as our proposal for the ISC strategy was that all those research, all those areas, all the research areas which are of interest to researchers and to official statistics, um, require gathering data from many different sources and require the integration and therefore the interoperability and reusability of those data. And that poses a fundamental challenge, not just of dis, uh, interoperability within a given discipline, which is already hard enough, as I'm sure um, you're aware, but the challenge of how we combine data across domains. Now, the, this happens in climate modeling, in modeling around smart cities, um, in the integration or, or analysis of uh, responses to climate change, so efforts to combine in analysis 
meteorological or climate data and societal uh, survey data. But it's not particularly easy. It's a challenging area. And a report which is often cited from the European Commission um, estimated that at least 80% of project effort goes into data wrangling, very manual cleaning of data prior to its integration and prior to its analysis. So that was an area that we felt that we needed to address. And in 2017, we organized a series of workshops. And it so happened that at very much the same time, um, a group within the DDI Alliance was looking at the next step for uh, DDI specifications and had started work on what they called DDI-CDI, cross, DDI cross-domain integration. Um, as a result of some of our pilot workshops held in Paris and at the Royal Society to explore these issues that I've, that I've just related to you, we made very strong connections with the DDI Alliance, and that led to collaboration at a series of workshops held at the Dagstall Center, the Leibniz Foundation Center for Informatics um, in the Saarland in Germany, and to collaboration on a number of projects. Most recently, um, it's also led into the European Commission funded project World Fair, which takes a set of 11 case studies from various domains or cross domain research areas and allows us to test these ideas with those case studies. Each case study will be exploring issues of interoperability and reusability in their domain or cross domain research areas, but they're also developing fair implementation profiles, which is a methodology for understanding how a given research area or community responds to the fair principles. And on the basis of that information, we'll be pursuing the work already underway on the cross-domain interoperability framework and making recommendations about that and for more domain-sensitive fair assessment. Please look up the FAIR, the World FAIR project, um, look up on the, uh, the CoData website about the decadal program to find out more about those things. But I wanted to mention that as some of the background and the context to our thinking about the cross-domain interoperability framework. I'll hand over now first to Arafan Gregory, who's a standards consultant with CoData and also works for the DDI Alliance. He will introduce this idea of the cross-domain interoperability framework and provide some further information about that. The second speaker is Flavio Rizzolo from Statistics Canada, and who's also a member of the DDI-CDI working group um, with the DDI Alliance. And he'll explore a, a really crucial part of the thinking in DDI-CDI and um, other standards, which is this the variable cascade, which links the concept to the variable to the measurement and is essential for interoperability within DDI-CDI and we think in other um, applications of that to, to cross-domain um, data. And then finally, Franck Coton from INSEE in France will provide a set of examples um, and of the coordinated use of standards for data production and dissemination, drawing in particular on the Interstat project. So that's the menu for this morning, this evening. Um, we hope that's caught your attention and that you'll find this exploration of interoperability and cross-domain interoperability interesting and useful for the Dublin Core community. And with no further ado, I will hand over to Arafan. Thank you, Simon. Um, so I am going to, let me pull up my slides here. Is that now in display mode? Not yet. Not yet in display mode, but we can see there. your deck. There it is. Okay. So um, I'm just going to make an observation. Uh, Simon talked about the history of, of CDIF, of the cross-domain interoperability framework. And um, 
something that that is, I think, a little striking about it is that unlike a lot of other things, which are are brilliant ideas that a set of academics come up with and publish about and then take credit for, C. diff is really an organic development that's come out of a process of what started out as workshops where people from different standards, metadata standards in the in the research space, got together and sort of started um, thinking about how they could work together, how they could use each other as ideas, and so on, and what can, has come out of that, one of the major outputs from that over the course of many years has been what we're calling C. diff now. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. But this isn't somebody's bright idea. I think it's more an emergent idea that simply makes sense. And so although we present this and, and that we're sort of leading the charge at this point on this, I think it's much bigger than um, any single sort of standard initiative or what have you, and, and uh, hopefully you'll understand that better as I get a little further into it. A um, couple of observations about FAIR sharing. Um, we've been in the business of trying to implement FAIR in different projects for a, for a few years now, and there's an idea out there that FAIR is about a researcher finding and using data, and that's true, of course, um, but I think in many ways it's a, it's a kind of naive view of the picture because what we really see in the FAIR space today primarily our domain infrastructures finding and integrating data for the researchers. And so the researchers want to get on with their research. They don't want to have to deal with the data wrangling that Simon was talking about. And they rely on their domain infrastructure players to do that. And increasingly, what we're seeing is that there are cross-domain infrastructures that want to perform the same function for research that goes beyond individual disciplinary or domain boundaries. And that's as true in the official statistics and governmental space as it is in the research space. And so when we say cross domain, we're talking about that much broader remit. Um, when you look around today, you see a lot of these open science cloud infrastructures, things like the European Open Science Cloud, the Global Open Science Cloud, the African Open Science Platform. There's a, one in China, there's one in Canada. These things are cropping up everywhere and they all look at metadata interoperability as part of their, of their necessary sort of um, remit. Um, Simon talked about uh, CoDatas and the, and the Decadal program. They have this notion of grand challenges, which are things like infectious disease and climate change and disaster risk reduction and so on. These big um, sort of issues in the world at large that demand, that are by their nature cross domain in terms of the data you need to understand and solve them, right? And that is really fundamentally the driver for, for CDIF, because we need to do really large scale fair data sharing. And ultimately what that means is scalability through automation. I think, um, I mean, to be very cynical, we've, we've um, put our planet in a very rough place. And if we're gonna get it out of that place, we're gonna bet on technology um, to help us understand the problem and solve the problem. And that means research and that means data. So, um, I think this idea that we need large scale fair data sharing is really a timely idea. And when you're talking about fair and that kind of data sharing, you're fundamentally talking about metadata. And um, you know, this is a DCMI conference, so everyone understands the importance of metadata on some level. I think fair is primarily a metadata thing, honestly. And it tends to be the gating factor in building any kind of large scale solution across uh, communities. When you look at FAIR, the most metadata intensive and resource intensive part is interoperability. And that's, I think, where CDIF really is, is focused. I'm gonna give you four quick slides that show you how much metadata there is in FAIR. Findability, yep, it's there. Accessibility, yep. Interoperability, yep. Okay, so two of the sub bullets don't have the word metadata in them. I think you get the picture. FAIR is about metadata. Um, and when we think about cross-domain fair sharing, this is maybe even, even more extreme because the metadata is necessary, but so are a lot of other things. And, and um, it's hard to, to, to split these out sometimes. When we think about what a large scale automated uh, infrastructure for data sharing is, we don't just need the shared metadata, we need services and applications that the providers and users can, can work to. We need some sort of a registry or cataloging infrastructure for data um, navigation and exchange. We do need that 
agreed information payload. And that's where I think a lot of the metadata standards come into play. We also need things like classifications of domains or communities or infrastructures that allow us to navigate and understand the space. And I could go on probably with a, a bunch of other bullets there, but this is a monumental task. There are large scale metadata driven data sharing infrastructures in the world, but I don't think there are any quite as big as the one that we're looking at building now. Um, so you have to ask the question, where do you start? And I think that um, there are some different, play, different approaches to this. We see the technology vendors today looking at architectures and how do we make scalable, shareable, um, or distributed architectures for services and cloud-based and so on. And um, that's one perspective. The perspective I think that we're taking with CDIF is really to look at that agreed information payload. And that means that to some extent, we have to understand the core functions of fair data sharing. But that's really the, the direction CDIF is coming from to begin to approach this sort of massive task. So what is CDIF? It is not another standard. We have thousands of standards already, and I love standards, I'm a standards guy, but fundamentally CDIF is something different. It's a set of recommended practice for using standards that already exist for the most part. And that's in order to support a core set of functions for cross-domain fair reuse. So this is saying, here are the things we need to do, here's the metadata we need, and we should agree to use the following standards in the following ways so they work together to support that network. And um, that's kind of what we're, we're looking at. Um, I see that as providing a very useful foundation for the creation of registries and applications and services. Um, it doesn't solve the problem of classifying domains and infrastructures and communities. That, that's a different problem. But at the end of the day, this does a big part of what we need to build the kind of scalable sort of fair infrastructure we're talking about. Here's the problem. If we take every domain standard and map it to every other domain standard, we will never be done. There are millions probably of combinations that would be useful to someone who's trying to reuse or, sh or share their data and metadata. Um, and this is not an old picture. If you come up with a common language that can sit in the middle, then you reduce the number of combinations to a more tractable number, right? A more tractable level. And CDIF is intending to be that kind of a lingua franca, that kind of a common tongue um, that can be used for this purpose within FAIR. So it's a simple idea. Now, nothing is ever really that clean or simple, but I think you get the picture. CDIF is that lingua franca. You might ask the question, yeah, but what about the FAIR digital object framework? Isn't that what those guys are doing? And they are doing part of it, honestly. Um, it is necessary that we have a set of basic protocols to support FAIR sharing. And presumably that's internet driven because that's the network we're working off of. Um, and the FAIR digital object framework is for us, I think the best contender because if the FAIR digital object framework doesn't do this, somebody else has to. You have to have this kind of foundational um, set of protocols <coughs> for finding and accessing and using um, FAIR digital assets. Um, GoFAIR is driving the FDOF development in a significant way and there's some others involved. We don't have specifications yet. They're having a thing they're calling the hot zone week in Leiden at the end of October. And um, we're gonna be going to, to that and talking to people. Hopefully we'll see some progress there and a better indication of what will come out of the fair digital object framework. Um, and I think it is a good contender for this, but something has to perform this function. The components of the fair digital object framework are three. You have the things called FIPS, fair implementation profiles, which are sort of descriptions of how a specific community is making itself fair. You have these repositories of fair digital objects called FDPs. And then you have the fair digital objects themselves. And that's a generic model for describing fair resources. And these are all good ideas and good pieces of work from what I've seen, even though they're not yet finished. And it looks sort of like this. You find a FIP and you learn what a domain is doing. You go to the relevant fair data point and you access the objects and you have all kinds of different types of metadata that that points you to. So you can assemble all the information you need to process the object, reuse the data, whatever it is. And um, this is a great vision. And that's what the Fair Digital Object Framework is gonna do, I guess. Um, but it's not enough. And it's not enough for exactly the reason 
that um, that I that you saw in the many to many, many to one diagram. There are simply too many different standards and too many different assets involved in this picture. If we don't have a core set of, of sort of standards to support core common functions, and we don't have that lingua franca, and we're not going to be able to make to make use of the fair digital object framework. All we'll be doing is creating a way of better sharing the fact that we live in silos, and that's not the goal. Um, so when we're thinking about that lingua franca, we have to identify standards that meet certain criteria. They have to be cross-domain standards. That is, they cannot be so tied into the practices or terminology of any single domain that, they, that they're impenetrable to other domains. They have to be flexible in terms of their technology implementation. The barriers to entry should be low. They should build on existing technology investments. And very importantly, they should be practical. That is, they should be based on real world requirements and real world patterns for information reuse. Um, that is use case driven, I think, in a significant way. And so you have scenarios like this, where you have, I might have a researcher who's doing their own integration and they, they're using like our libraries or some sort of CDF aware client. And they could search based on say schema.org, which might be a CDF standard, and then pull things from these different domain players, all of whom have these connectors, which are translators between their domain languages and the, the lingua franca. And each of these would have some sort of an agreement exposing what services they provide. That's the idea. Maybe a more likely scenario is that you'd have a data integrator performing that, that set of functions for the user. They're fundamentally, from a CDF perspective, the same job. Um, when you think about the functions that you need to perform to support FAIR, FAIR is a set of principles, not a functional breakdown, although the two are sort of aligned. This is a very quick take on this, and maybe, maybe I, certainly this will be changed as we work through it further. But yes, you need to be able to find resources in catalogs through search. You need to be able to assess a resource before you gain access to it sometimes. Is it fit for purpose? Is the geography right? Is it granular enough? Is, is the, the time component correct? Questions like that. You need to be able to meet the conditions of use and access it. Interoperability, reusability um, require a lot of different things. You need to be able to, to import the thing into your systems, to understand it, and then to be able to use it in an effective way. Very metadata intensive, as I said. Um, and there's a requirement also to manage this entire process. Ideally, these are automated functions. It would be nice if this could be done affordably and with easily usable software and services and solutions, but this is a big ask, right? This is what we're looking at. I'd like to go into some of the candidate standards, and this is maybe where things will become a little more familiar to you, because CDIF, as I said, is a body of practice. It's not a, a, a new standard unto itself. I'm going to do this according to that functional breakdown. Um, for findability, I really see there being two main contenders today, um, DCAT and the profiles of DCAT and schema.org. And I would like to point out that both of these are to some extent based on Dublin Core. You see an awful lot of Dublin Core in the world these days. There are so many domain specific configurations of Dublin Core that that itself becomes a sort of problem. But I think that fundamentally Dublin Core has built a foundation that is bearing fruit it's not that it's going out of existence, it's that it's being used in new ways. And two of those ways are DCAT and schema.org, but these are pretty well adopted, fully functional ways of discovering data in different modes. And they are being, they are being very, very widely adopted for fair purposes. Um, I, things like DOIs and similar kinds of identifiers, um, I think are already pretty ubiquitous. And those become important standards for persistent identification and will be part of CDIF. Um, I don't think that takes a lot of thinking, although it might. Um, when we get to accessibility, we're seeing um, a, a slightly different picture because there has not been a lot of practice in this area in the recent past within the research domain or the, or the statistical domains. Um, what we're really looking at is a thing called the Open Digital Rights Language, ODRL. And I don't think that's the current version. I may be out of date there. Um, there's a thing called the Data Privacy Vocabulary, both from W3C. There are some other models and standards we've looked at, like Duo is one, there's a tagging, the tags is another. Um, 
there's a lot of exploration and even some prototyping going on in this space now, but this is not a very standards rich area of the functionality. It's kind of a new thing and it's a difficult thing to solve, but it is being addressed now. Um, when you get to interoperability and reuse, I think this is where a lot of the focus needs to be. Traditionally very labor intensive and that's not gonna be good enough. We're gonna need more and better machine actionable metadata if we want this to scale. Um, and I'm really looking at, I think, at three different aspects here. Structural metadata, semantics and vocabularies, and then context and what I call fully described observations of interest. This includes provenance information, but goes into a lot more detail. And um, I'd like to do sort of a slide on each of those. Structural metadata is that metadata that doesn't talk about the meaning of things, but simply the way the things are arranged physically and logically within data streams and data sets and databases. And um, I think CDI, DDI CDI is probably the one standard that is really designed for this purpose. Um, but there are some other relevant standards and Flavia will talk more about DDI CDI. Um, we have things like CSV on the web and the data cube vocabulary and the SDMX standards. Um, we have things like the metadata vocabulary for tabular data and some other interesting things like NGSILD and SOSA SSN, but all of those are more limited in their breadth. And what we need is something that is very broad in terms of describing the logical and physical structures of data independent of their semantics. And that's what CDI is all about really. Um, there's a slide on CDI. I'm not gonna go deeply into this other than to point out that it's model driven. So it's technology agnostic. It's designed to fill the gaps between other standards in something like CDIF. It's domain independent. So it can be fit, configured to reflect domain semantics. And um, it's designed to provide some of the metadata we need for CDIF, but only that, only really that, that structural piece and, and the tiebacks to things like provenance and process. When we get into the semantic space, this is a very, very challenging one. And there are a lot of domain specific ontologies and vocabularies. I mean, thousands and thousands of them anymore. And that's great because they describe domains in a useful way. But for CDIF, we don't want domain specifics. We want things that, that are cross domain. When we look at geography and time, there are some useful standards there. And also for units of measure. And their CODATA has a, a group called DRUM, the Digital Representation of Units of Measure that has some recommendations that are good. Um, we have some useful standards for describing ontologies and vocabularies like OWL, RDF schema, SCOS and now XCOS, and I think um, Frank may talk a little bit about those, um, very important. But when you start attaching semantics to data, that is the way that different concepts and definitions play roles vis-a-vis -vis data structures, then things get very complicated. Um, we do have uh, uh, some guidance that came out of the Dagstool workshops called the 10 simple rules for dealing with controlled vocabularies in a fair sense. Um, but again, that's not a, a, a one size fits all approach to semantics. Ultimately, we need to bridge and handle the domain specific ontologies and vocabularies. And that means things like SSSOM. Um, there are things like the FAIRS FAIRS meta model for semantic resources we're looking into, Obo Foundry and BioPortal. There are some efforts in this space that we need to pay attention to. I don't know how that will impact CDIP, but this is a, a tough problem that we have to solve. When I get into what I call context and fully described observations of interest, we are talking about things like prov and provenance information. We're talking about processing standards like SDTL and VTL and similar languages that describe the way that data can be processed. They're almost executable programming languages, but they're not platform specific. Um, we also get into standards like iAdopt and um, the observation and measurements work from OGC. Um, what these standards do is tell you what, what cluster of data points you need in order to reuse a measurement. And that's an Im incredibly important when you're going across domains because there isn't an understood set of practice within the domain. And so um, I don't know if those standards specifically can be used directly, but we know that we need something like it. If I give you a measurement, you need to know, do I know enough to reuse it responsibly? And that's very important. That's still a pretty new area. And lastly, um, we have things like GAMSO and SARA, which are models for managing fair resources at the business level. 
Because at the end of the day, we have to connect research and, and data to policy and to the business of, of solving real world problems. And that demands having a handle on what these fair things are and how they relate to the projects and initiatives and governmental efforts and so on. And those models like Seraph and Gamso, and maybe there are others that we don't know about yet, um, may come into play here. I'm not sure how much of this is exchangeable, but I suspect some of it might be as this, be, as this sort of vision becomes more real. So that's kind of a list of, of, um, of recommended standards of candidate standards, we're calling them. And there are no doubt many others. We're still looking at different things. Um, Simon talked about the history of CDF, that this comes from a, a series of workshops and conferences at Dagstool and elsewhere. Since I'm thinking the first Dagstool workshop was 2018, but the discussion certainly started earlier. We've looked at a lot of different use cases. There's been a lot of presentation, discussion. There's been some prototyping. Now, as of the, the Dagstool workshop this past September, we have a draft of CDF for the first time. It's a very, very early draft, more outline than draft really. But um, that is something that has sort of come into being and will be carried forward in the near term under the auspices of the World Fair project that Simon mentioned. Although it will involve people who are not directly or otherwise involved in that project as well. There are 11 different work packages looking at different domains. And so it's got pretty broad coverage. Um, but once CDIF comes out as a more finished draft from the World Fair project, um, it needs to have a home somewhere and it will need to have some sort of a committee or working group that does the drafting, advises on directions, makes decisions, reviews recommendations and so on. And we're still not sure exactly what that's looking like. We're in the process of recruiting people to do that work now that we have a better sense of what it is that we're creating. We still need to find this a long-term home, whether that's CoData and RDA, whether that involves you know, organizations within the UN, I don't know who, who can do that. But we know that this is something that needs to be broadly sort of publicized and, and maintained in a serious way. So that's kind of where we are right now. It's an idea that's coming into being. As I say, it's sort of an emergent thing, but it's becoming realer year on year. The current shape of the outline kind of looks like this. Arifem, just so you yes. know, that's your that's your 20 minutes. Um, okay. Well, that's 20 minutes. No time. rush. Okay, that's my fine. Last. No rush in any I, case. We've got plenty of time. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Sam. This is my last slide. This is the current shape of, of CDIF, and just as a, the very highest level. We have an overview, design principles, a discussion of activities and capabilities, um, then looking at the functions that support those things and the information payloads, and then a section on the standards and profiles of those standards that would uh, support those, those information payloads specifically. And so that's sort of the way we're approaching this in as a document organization. Now, this could change. So this is just the current draft. Um, and that's pretty much all I've got to, to say at this point. I hope that gives you a better sense of what CDIF is. It is a very ambitious thing, but I'm a big believer that if you don't think forward about what you're trying to build, and if you accept that it's impossible, then it is impossible. And I think that we can't afford to fail here. There's too much demand for this. And if we if we build things like CDF and the, the other pieces of this picture, we can have a solution that really works. So that's that's where I'm gonna um, leave this and turn over now, I think to Flavio to do um, something more, um, a little more concrete around DDI CDI, which is part of this picture. So thanks very much, Arafan. Yes, we will, we'll, I should have said this at the beginning, but we'll run through all three presentations um, together and have questions and discussion at the end. And I think it's important um, to do it that way so that um, participants in this session see this introduction from Arafan, that we see the detail about the variable cascade from, from Flavio, and we hear about the implementation from Frog, and then we'll be in a position to have a, a more detailed uh, discussion of CDIF and of DDI CDI. So without further ado, um, I'll hand over to Flavio. And if you have any questions or thoughts on what Arafan said, please put those in the chat so we can come back to those. Flavio, the floor is yours. Thank you, Simon and Arafan. So I will piggyback on what Arafan was saying in terms of uh, the standards that uh, need to be part of CDIF. And I'm going to focus now on uh, DDI-CDI and the role that plays trying to kind of 
put together these standards. So what's the DI CDI? So it's, it's a model and specification designed to support cross-domain data production activities. So as a modeling language, we use UML, which is the gold standard for information modeling at this point. Uh, UML facilitates implementations across technology platforms and is quite future-proof. The DI CDI includes a few syntax representations and the ability to create new ones from the UML model. It supports uh, a variety of uh, data production environments, ranging from traditional and academic research projects, which are more exploratory and ad hoc in nature, to sophisticated data platforms used in national statistical agencies, for instance, and large data producing organizations that rely on standardized tools and optimized uh, platforms based on strict data governance and quality frameworks. The DACDA also supports the development of libraries for different languages like R and Python. The model includes three core areas, data structures and the representations, processes and concepts. So DDI-CDI can function as a sort of integration bridge between models, standards and specifications at different levels of abstraction. And Arofan discussed already some of them. Uh, GSBPM and GSIM and CSDA at the top are conceptual models describing different types of the building blocks of statistical production that DDI-CDI can enable and implement. In addition, DDI-CDI can integrate with other DDI and non-DDI implementation standards. For instance, following clockwise from CSDA, um, DDI lifecycle for data documentation and management, SDTL for data transformations, and SCOS for structure control vocabularies and classifications. Those three are all part of the DDI product suite. Um, then there is also the integration with SDMX for aggregate data documentation, Provo for provenance and lineage, DCAT and its dialects like StatDCAT and GeoDCAT for data cataloging together with schema.org for search and discovery. And finally, SCOS for organizing concepts and their relationships. And there are many more that we can mention here. Um, this ability to ena enable, implement and integrate other standards across um, uh, basically across the whole uh, set of uh, potential standards that uh, people are using at this point, places DDI-CDI in a unique position to help creating machine actionable metadata-driven solutions for all sorts of scenarios. So, okay, this diagram shows the backbone of DDI-CDI. The full specification includes other classes that provide additional details that uh, from what you see here. So at the center, we have the variable cascade, which provides the conceptual, representational, and instance level description of variables. The variable cascade ties together the organization of the data on the left with the concepts and representations on the right. Essentially, essentially uh, data consists of data points that can be uniquely identified by keys and organized into data sets, which are described by data structures. Variables capture concepts that are described by, by the domains. And these concepts are, when they are discrete, they are represented as code lists or classifications composed of categories and their codes. The process description at the top describes how these objects are created, used, and transformed by activities performing uh, some sort of control logic. And, and these activities are basically performed by agents. Let's see now how the variable cascade works in more detail. So the cascade consists of three layers of variables conceptual represented at instance. Each layer corresponds to an ever increasing level of detail and never decreasing level of reusability. But before even talking about variables, we need to define what a concept is. So a concept is essentially a unit of thought. For instance, marital status, poverty, income, and gender. In the case of marital status, the concept can be summed up as the relationship uh, a person has with a significant other. Now a conceptual variable, is a concept we want to measure for a specific unit type, in this case, a person. The concept is further described with the conceptual domain, which in this example includes categories like single and married. Conceptual variables appear at the beginning of the design process when people are just starting to figure out what they want to study and measure. Later on, they can be used for search and discovery, like give me all the variables about marital status or provenance and reusability or many more uses. Even that it is the most generic of the three, it is also the most reusable. So conceptual variables can be the basic building blocks to define other layers in the variable cascade. 
A represented variable is related to the universe, like immigrant families or university students. So it's a more refined uh, or a subset of the unit type. In other words, a represented variable is a conceptual variable applied to a specific universe. It includes a representation in terms of a value domain, which assigns codes to the categories in the conceptual domain, like M for married or D for divorce. Some additional information, which is not shown here, include the notion of intended data type, for instance, which is a generic and platform independent data type based on the ISO 11404 standard, which defines data types in terms of set of values and operations, allows on them, and a unit of measurement, for instance, like US dollars, kilograms, etc. So represented variables provide a low level of reusability since they are more specific than the conceptual ones, but they still can be reused across data instances. Now, before continuing, uh, note the human notation in the diagram. The arrows with the full triangle arrowhead at the top end indicate that the bottom box is an extension of the top box. What that means is that, for instance, a representative variable is an extension of a conceptual variable. This means that the representative variable, in addition to its own relationships uh, to value domain and universe, also inherits all the relationships from the conceptual variable. That makes life easier when we don't need a, a separation between conceptual and represented levels. So in that case, it's possible to just define a representative variable without having to create and manage conceptual ones, since we get everything from the conceptual one for free. Of course, what we don't get is the ability to manage them independently. So depending on the use case, you might actually create all the levels or just one. So finally, uh, so we get the lower level, which is the instance variable. An instance variable is not reusable at all since it captures the use of a represented variable within an individual data instance. In fact, instance variables describe how data points appear in the data instance, which include platform in the specific uh, information like physical data types and sentinel values, which are not shown here. So physical data types describe how the data is written in a, its physical form, like in a file or a relational table, while sentinel values encode supplementary meaning like missing or null values, which are used for processing. An instance uh, variable applies to a specialization of universe, which is called population, uh, which is essentially a universe in time and space, like immigrant families in Canada in 2022. Uh, note as well that the instance variable is an extension of the represented variable, again denoted by the arrow with the full arrow head. So this provides great flexibility since an organization could decide whether to use and manage all levels, two of them, or just one as, as they mentioned. Now let's see how this works with a concrete example. So all the variables here in this picture measure marital status and therefore link to the concept of marital status not shown in the, in the picture. Legal marital status is the conceptual variable at the top, which provides the common specification that might include the usual categories like married, separated, etc. Categories are themselves concepts with their own definitions. For instance, married can be defined in different ways as either legally married or in a civil union or both. One level down, we find marital and marital B in green. They are both about legal marital status, but they use different encodings for their categories, which is numerical on the left and alphabetical on the right. For instance, the code for married is one in marital and M in marital B. At the bottom, we have marital 2004, 2008, and marital B 2018, which are instance variables in three different data instances corresponding to 2004, 2008, and 18, respectively. At first glance, uh, it's not clear whether these three variables at the bottom are the same or not. One may think that they are the same because of the similar names. But using the cascade, we can see that two of the variables use alphabetical codes and the other one numeric. So how do we integrate such data? Well, using the cascade, we can trace each code to a category and use the information to link records that refer to the same category, even when their codes are different. Now, the variable cascade has many applications for interpretability. Here, we take a brief look at comparability and uh, integration. In any large data producing organization, and even more so across organizations, there is a proliferation of variables that uh, represent similar things. So how do we maintain the relationship between similar variables while at the same time capturing the differences? 
But we just saw an example of how to maintain those relationships among categories that use different encodings. Another common case is when two variables measure the same concept, but differently. In this case, not just the encodings are different, but also the categories behind the encoding are. For instance, marriage uh, status could have separate categories for legally married and for civil union in one conceptual variable, but the same category putting them together in another one. A more subtle case is the one with different units of measurement, for instance, Canadian dollars versus US dollars. Here we cannot count with spotting the difference in the actual data since the data types for representing both currencies uh, tend to be the same and the numbers are very similar. So in this case, we depend on the common conceptual variable between them to keep track of the relationships. This way, the amounts in the different currencies can be properly converted before doing data integration. Therefore, the data itself is often not enough to perform the integration accurate, accurately. Um, the variable cascade can help in enabling more robust data integration solutions by documenting variable relationships in detail. So again, this goes back to what Arfa mentioned about that in order to get this level of interoperability that, that FAIR requires, we really need metadata in many forms. Now, how is the data actually organized? Data can be organized into data sets and in their data structures to describe it. DDI CDI includes four basic types of data structures, uh, wide, long, dimensional, and key value. Uh, wide represents rectangular data where each record contains a set of observations about a single unit together with a unit identifier. In long data, in contrast, some columns are transposed so that they appear as different records. This is commonly used to describe sensor and event data. The transposition is also common when performing data analysis. Dimensional data contains observations that are defined in terms of dimensions. Uh, observations are identified by combinations of values from the dimensions, one from each. Finally, key value is ideal for data that is semi-structured or just irregular, but it can also capture regular data uh, like the wide and long. These different types of data organizations are all uh, described with a consistent set of components for identification, measures, descriptive fields, and so on. The difference between these data structures boils down to the different roles played by these components. We'll now show with some examples uh, how these data structures work. So this table shows a data set of medical measurements in wide form together with some annotations and qualifiers. Identifier, measure, and attribute components provide contextual information about the use of variables in a data set. They essentially capture the roles variables play. The data set is an organized collection of data that consists of data points and key, as we mentioned. Data points are the cells in the table, and keys are combinations of data point values used to identify a row. For instance, the entry and, and date time columns define a key since each row has a different combinations of values from those two variables. Some variables function as unit identifiers, for instance, the entry column in the table. Other variables function as measures, capturing the observations of interest, for instance, the systolic and diastolic columns. Yet other variables provide additional contextual and qualifier information, like under which circumstances the measurement was captured, by which instrument, or when, for instance, the date time column. Now, the same data from the previous table can be expressed in a different data structure called long, as shown in this table. This data structure is often used to express event, event data, as mentioned, but it can be used to represent any other type of organization. Some of the variables in wide form can be transposed into columns. Uh, the variable description component and the variable value component are the columns capturing this transposition. A usual way of creating this transposition is to make the names of the transposed columns into values of the variable descriptor component. For instance, systolic and diastolic, which now appears as values. The actual values these variables take appear now as values of the variable value component column. So this transposition effectively moves information from the column headers in, in wide to the table content in long. Additional columns include identifier components, which are never transposed, and other variables, either measures or attributes that are maintained in wide form, depending on the need of analysis. 
Now, <coughs> the ability to move data from one type of data organization to another has many applications for interoperability. Here we look at uh, cross-domain integration, uh, two in the cross-domain integration space. Domains come usually with their own semantics in terms of concepts and vocabularies and tend to favor certain data organizations over others. For instance, sensor data, as mentioned, is usually captured and shared in long data structures. Survey data has been historically exchanged and published in wide data structures. And summary data, um, aggregate data, is usually organized in multidimensional data cubes. A cross-domain standard like CDI needs to be able to describe these common data structures and transform data among them. However, no standard is going to be able to include all the details needed to document and integrate data across disciplines. One way of addressing this is by providing a referencing mechanism across the standard so that the cross-domain standard is only with the integration framework while referring to the domain-specific standards when necessary. Such an approach still creates some challenges on machine action solutions since they still need to understand and manipulate the different structures. So how the, 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 to apply separation of concerns in this context so that the role of each standard is well understood is critical uh, for this uh, type of cross-domain solutions and for making them machine actionable. So to round up the data structures, we briefly discuss uh, dimensional and key value. Dimensional data structures are centered around the notion of multidimensional data cubes, in which each cell has an aggregate value and is identified by values in a set of uh, dimensions of interest. The top table here is, the, is a two-dimensional cube given by species and fishing uh, equipment groups. The value in each cell is the sum of the round weight column in the bottom table. What is critical here is to know which columns from the bottom table becomes a dimension and which ones a measure where the value in the cells are computed from. So we, finally, we get to key value, which is actually the simplest and most flexible type of data organization you can think of. It's based on the programming notion of assigning a value to a key. So a key is like an address or an identifier that provides a reference to a value. Values then can be retrieved by key. It's that simple. Values can be simple, such as an integer or a string, or complex like JSON structures or an array. Keys can only be a structure with a special uh, characters such as colons or slashes, which allows uh, the use of namespaces that can provide additional uh, structuring. Key values are considered schema-less. In other words, they are not, there are no integrity constraints here defined beforehand. This example uh, is about sensor data in two different formats, long at the top and key value at the bottom. Both are suitable for this type of data streams, but key value has definitely the edge on high performance and flexibility, which are requirements in the case of uh, online sensor data processing. Note also that the sensor ID and property are concatenated in a single key. Uh, the key could be decomposed then into the sensor ID or, or, and property uh, later on when needed. Time and uh, resulting value can also be combined into a single field using JSON or any other markup language. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. And, and this has been essentially the, the, the top uh, approach to DDI CDI in terms of the variable cascade and some of the data structures. So uh, we can go into more details uh, in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Flavio. That's that's excellent, and I um, I'm sure people will have found that a fascinating insight into DDI CDI, the variable cascade, and the description of data structure um, that's in that. So we'll hand over now to uh, Frank. Please do think of any questions or comments and put them in the chat. Um, and Frank, the floor is yours. Yes. Hello. Hello, everybody. So hope you can see my screen. Uh, so I'm uh, Franck, uh, Franck Coton. I'm working in uh, INSEE. INSEE is the French uh, Statistical Institute, uh, National Statistic Statistical Institute. And uh, probably my presentation will be a bit uh, a bit different uh, from the previous presentation because 
I'm more of a metadata practitioner here, and uh, what I would like is to to tell uh, maybe the stories of uh, the story of how we we use metadata standards at uh, at INSEE in combinations, and uh, and how we kind of uh, develop a strategy, a strategy around uh, this use of uh, standards and metadata standards, and actually. Uh, uh, to give an illustration of how standards can be used in combination in real uh, uh, concrete use case, let's say, and maybe, uh, let's say, industrial use cases. You see. So, um, first of all, a few words about INSEE, just to set uh, the scene. Uh, so, as I said, it's the French National Statistical Institute, and it does, as most statistical institutes, uh, business and household surveys. It uh, conducts the population census. It produces national accounts. Uh, INSEE is a bit particular uh, among the, 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 the other national statistical institutes because we do studies, also economic studies, uh, which is not very usual for statistical institutes. And also we manage uh, a bunch of uh, big administrative registers like the business register or the population. Oh, oh. So that's, that's a bit uh, unusual for we also have in charge the coordination of the French statistical system. We do uh, quite a lot of international cooperation, of course. Uh, just to give you some figures, uh, it says about a bit more than uh, 1,000 people and a bit less than uh, 500 million euro budget. So, what uh, I'm going to talk to, you, to talk to you about is the, the statistical. Statistical metadata we use at INSEE. We have um, a, a centralized, let's say, uh, statistical metadata repository. It's called Hermes, or repository. Well, in French, it's an, an acronym. Uh, there is a link if you're interested uh, here behind the Hermes system uh, to a more, much more detailed article in English. So once you have the presentation, you can click on the link and go to the, to the, to the more, more detailed. So, uh, Hermes was like uh, uh, started um, 10 years ago now, a bit more than 10 years ago. It uh, started like a quite simple system, let's say. But uh, since the beginning, we have uh, laid out uh, some called them values here, but you can also call them strategical axes or things like that. Uh, anyway, it's Basically, we want to rely on standards, open standards and international standards. Uh, we want also the system to be as open as can be. So we produce every metadata, which is is, is is published as open metadata. data. We also want the metadata in Hermes to be active, which means uh, we will have an illustration in the next slide. Basically, it means that the metadata is not only for documenting things, it's also to produce things, to create things from the metadata, create bunch, uh, pieces of the statistical process from the description in metadata. And also we have this principle of, of course, it once only, it's probably not, not a good term, but we want to uh, be able to follow the operations all along their cycle and not to ask responsible of the operation several times for the same metadata. So that's a very important thing for us. Basically how Hermes is organized is there are two main parts, uh, let's say repository. One is based on uh, DDI, we just uh, saw in Flavio's and also in Arafan's presentation. So DDI is used in INSEE for the representation of questionnaires. Of course, questionnaires are the very important thing for us. Uh, variables also, which belong to questionnaires. Um, on the other hand, we have uh, uh, much more uh, detailed information on uh, in an RTF database. So we have uh, information about classification, we have the concepts, we have what we call the statistical operations, so the different surveys, for example, the different uh, um, processes that we run at INSEE. Uh, we have metadata on quality, we have metadata on description of products, etc. Et so 
let's say, two main uh, uh, pieces of repository, but they communicate and so logically for the clients that can be seen as one. So we have uh, the possibility to access these repositories via the client applications that you can see on the on the top to browse, to search, to, to export the metadata. We have also the possibilities to access by APIs, uh, and we have management uh, applications so for the RDF uh, repository on one side and for the DDI repository on the other side. So if we now turn to uh, the, the concrete use of standards uh, in the uh, in say, so the, the standards that you saw in the previous slide stored in the metadata repositories, of course, we use them. Now. Um, if we start from the, let's say, the beginning of the statistical process, uh, of course, the, the first thing when you do statistics is to collect data. And most of the time, we now we collect data through surveys. Uh, so that means that we have questionnaires that we send to people or to, to businesses. Uh, and uh, in uh, this area of the statistical process, we rely heavily uh, on the DDI. Uh, DDI is, uh, we already saw that, uh, is a quite encompassing standard, but it has uh, in particular a module which is about data collection. So the representation of what we call survey, survey instruments, which is very detailed and which allows for the formalization of very complex questionnaire with the logic flow, with the links to the variable, to the concepts, etc. Et and how we use DDI is um, quite extreme, let's say, because we actually have a, a, a survey data collection platform, which is entirely uh, based on DDI. So we have a fully automated DDI-based multi-mode collection instrument generator. And I would like to insist on fully automated. So from the description in DDI of the questionnaires, we generate the collection instruments. So that is the paper questionnaire, that is the web questionnaire, that is the questionnaire that is submitted through survey field agents, etc. Et so from one representation of the questionnaire in DDI, we can generate fully 100% uh, the uh, collection instruments that are uh, used uh, to uh, collect the data. So we started uh, this uh, pattern uh, with the business survey a few years ago, eight years ago now. Then we turn to the household surveys, which have in general questionnaires, which are a bit more complicated than the business surveys. And now we use it and we're starting to use it for administrative sources because, of course, surveys are historically the, the main uh, food for, for statistical institutes, let's say. But now we, of course, turn to more usage of administrative sources and even of, of big data, sensor data, and things like that. So we also want to use uh, DTI to document uh, as soon as possible uh, these sources uh, in a fully uh, uh, structured way so we can integrate them in our system. When I said industrial at the beginning of the presentation, you can see that it's the case here because we send now uh, every year one more than one million actually uh, uh, questionnaires, so paper questionnaire or web questionnaire, et cetera which are fully automatically produced from the DDI uh, the representation. At the other end of, let's say, the, the statistical process, we uh, disseminate statistical information, statistical data. And for this, we use a, 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 a standard, which is called SDMX. I'm not sure it's been mentioned already, but uh, SDMX is a, quite an old standard now with was initially made for uh, exchanging uh, of statistical uh, information and in particular of uh, uh, cubes, uh, hypercubes of information, so aggregated data. Uh, we use it uh, in different contexts. Uh, we use it to transmit uh, data to uh, different uh, international organizations, for example, to Eurostat, the World Bank, the IMF, etc. So we use the French acronym, but it's the IMF. Um, we also have uh, web services, which are based on the STM standards for uh, the dissemination of macro macroeconomic indicators. We use also we use also SDMX for a specific uh, system, which is used to disseminate harmonized information at the European level uh, about census population census. It's called the Census Hub. Uh, 
We use it also uh, as integrate for, for integration with other standards. Uh, Simon mentioned uh, MGS ILD and the Interstat project uh, in the introduction. That's actually, we are looking into how we can disseminate SDNX information or data through uh, some component, which is called the context broker, which is used at the European level to disseminate uh, uh, contextualized information. Contextualized meaning that uh, uh, the actual information is depends on the context of the consumer. So its location, it, it, the time of consumption, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, we use quite, a lot of SDMX um, for the dissemination. And when I say SDMX, the original standard is, uh, is a, as a, a model, which is UML also, and also a syntax, which is uh, XML. But there is a um, RDF uh, representation of the SDMX data model, which is called DataCube, be aware of. And we use this uh, DataCube um standard it's a w3c recommendation we use it for the structuration of the chain of dissemination of our uh, statistical data aggregate data actually so we use it essentially to specify the structure of the data that we disseminate and then from the structure and from the raw method from the raw data we produce various data dissemination formats like csv uh, Excel dynamic table. If we now uh, turn to more, let's say, transversal uh, uh, standards or transversal activities like uh, uh, the management of concepts or classifications or code lists, which run through the whole statistical process from the uh, data acquisition to the data dissemination. We have, uh, of course, uh, regarding uh, statistical concept. We use cost, not very original, but it's very effective. Uh, we have a thesaurus of uh, a bit more than uh, 100 uh, and uh, 1,200 uh, uh, statistical definitions, what we call definitions, it's actually concepts. Each of them have, uh, each of them has uh, long and short definitions, both in French and in English. And uh, we also have uh, additional pro properties, which can be doubling core. In some cases, we have doubling core properties for the management of uh, the workflow for validation of the concepts and definitions. So we have the notion of concept owner, for example, uh, which is uh, responsible for the evolution and the management. And we have recently started an activity for alignment uh, we're trying to align our concepts with external thesauri like uh, Eurovoc, for example, or, or, or uh, other uh, external concepts in order to be able to publish not only the concepts, but also links to external concepts of thesauri. Uh, we, of course, also use those for, for controlled vocabularies and consistent. This is quite, quite similar, I'd say. Uh, another uh, standards that we are using is uh, it's been mentioned already by by, by Flavio. It's Excos, uh, uh, a statistical institute. We are uh, at publishing and using actually uh, statistical classifications. Statistical classifications are a bit more, let's say, uh, formally organized than uh, usual concept schemes. They're usually organized in, in hierarchical levels. They have a lot of structural textual material, explanatory notes and things like that. There's also a, 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 a importance is, is laid on uh, the, the evolution of uh, the classifications, for example, from one version to the other, because we want to keep track of the temporal series, for example. And also the organization of the uh, classifications at the international levels. So typically you have classifications which are, which are defined at the international level. For example, the city is a classification and activity which is defined at the UN level. And then you have a, 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 a European uh, a specification which is more detailed and then the French or English or whatever. So uh, it's a bit more, let's say, uh, uh, formally organized than, uh, than uh, your usual uh, so XCOS is a, is a made for representing statistical classification. It's uh, actually published by the DBI Alliance. And as I said, it's uh, 
uh, additional, it's based on SCOS, of course, but uh, it adds things for the representation of book specification, in particular uh, for the concept association, the con concordances or correspondence table. Uh, we define also additional semantic properties, et cetera, et cetera. And we are currently working on the document of best practice uh, for using Xcos. So if you're interested in that, just mail me. We also, uh, so that, that, let's say, were the three uh, more, more important uh, aspects of, uh, of our usage of standards. So for data acquisition, for data dissemination, and for metadata management or representation. Uh, but we use a bunch of also other different standards. Uh, Flavio mentioned the PSDPM uh, and the GSIM. Those are typical uh, statistical models, let's say. So it's just too much on that. So we use a standard which is based on uh, SDMX also, which is defined by Eurostat for the quality reporting. So when you want to attach some quality metadata to the data that you disseminate, uh, we use this standard, which is uh, based on STMX. Uh, if we uh, turn to process uh, description, uh, we use BPMM. There's a thing also to do. Uh, well, Arfan mentioned VTL. So VTL is a language uh, which is, uh, let's say, at the logical level. So it's uh, implementation, let's not not independent, but it can be implemented easily in different environments. Uh, and it's used to represent data transformation, data validation. Uh, a very important one, uh, it's already been mentioned, is uh, DCAT, because we, of course, want to uh, make catalogs of data that we disseminate, but also of the data that we use. Uh, for example, the, the administrative data that we are collecting from the different organisms we want to be able to trust to track uh, how they are used by whom internally etc cetera, etc cetera. so we have an internal catalog that we are starting to build which is based on decat and as i said we use double core we use provenance uh, ontology for 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 that, that lineage of provenance we use the data quality vocabulary use so yeah a lot of different and it's the same uh, i'm not sure how i'm doing on time but just conclusion, uh, which would be, let's say, my modest uh, uh, contribution, what I've maybe learned during all this uh, trip uh, of INSEE on defining a metadata, metadata system, and metadata repositories. So what we did uh, uh, is to really define at the beginning, as I said, the metadata strategy and stick to it. So usually metadata is not really a sexy thing when you talk to your director, for example. So there might be highs and lows when you're implementing uh, your vision, but it's important that we stick to this vision. And uh, at the end, you, I think, uh, manage to, to, to make this vision uh, understood by uh, business people. So as I said, we rely on the uh, open standards, and I think it's a very important thing because it's a uh, it fosters uh, the possibility to uh, collaborate with your uh, peers, uh, and in particular at the European and, and international level with other statistical institutes. And uh, that's very fruitful. Um, another thing that I would like to say is that uh, well, metadata, good metadata, is active metadata. Uh, I'm, I'm really sure that when you use metadata just to document uh, things after the fact, uh, usually you don't have good quality metadata. If you want really good quality metadata, you have to use metadata, as I said, as the, the part of the code source, uh, the source of, the, of the, uh, the process. So you have to generate actually pieces of the statistical process or any process that were, uh, from the metadata. Um, it's okay to make standards. You just have to, uh, to to use the right standard at the right place. But uh, it's okay to use several standards. Don't, we, we, some, sometimes if you you find people that say, uh, "Okay, your your my standards is is uh, is, uh, is good for everything," 
generally not true. It's okay to, to have a bunch of uh, different standards. It, what's important is to use the right standard at the right place. And for that, I must say that uh, it's, uh, it's very convenient uh, uh, to have uh, models like RDF, which is uh, very good at uh, metadata integration. Uh, it's good for data integration. And also, last things I wanted to say is that the standards are important, but it's also important to define the way to use the standards. So profiles, best practice, collaboration on how to use standards. That's uh, actually uh, even it's uh, more important than the formal and uh, conceptual definition. Of it. So yeah, that's my take. Uh, I hope it's I mean uh, in time for the conclusion. Thank you very much, Franck. Yes, that was perfect. Everyone was pretty much twenty-five minutes. We had my introduction and and um, a little bit more from from Arafan. So we've got fifteen minutes. Thank you very much. Um, thanks to the the speakers. Thank you for the participants, the attendees, for your for your interest and your attention and your questions. Thanks very much to to Samo for the idea that we. Um, that we participate in the conference with these with these ideas and thanks very much for the for the warmer um the warmer reception that you've given them we'll follow up on mm -hmm. on some of the ideas that have been mentioned yeah thank you very much for your wonderful panel thank you all we'll we'll speak to you soon bye